Good morning, everybody. Thanks for attending. Welcome to anaesthetists, um, other clinicians, and non-anaesthetists alike. Thank you very much for attending this particular session. It's one of the jewels in the National Scientific Congress, the Geoffrey Kay Lecture. As a graduate of Monash University, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Associate Professor David M. Scott. David still currently is the federal president of the Australian Society of Anaesthetists and was previously the executive counsellor. Currently, he's working in private practice in northern New South Wales and southeast Queensland. He was commissioned as an officer in the Australian Royal Australian Air Force in 1990 and since then has held several leadership roles in the ADF, deployed multiple times and has served with the US Navy, Air Force and Army and is on the instructor panel of the Uniformed Services University of Health Sciences, Bethesda, USA. David has worked as an instructor in anaesthesia at Harvard University at the Beth Israel Hospital, Boston, and held the position of visiting professor in anaesthesia, University of California, Davis, Sacramento. He is also past and founding chair of the ANSCA ASA NZSA Regional Anesthesia Special Interest Group and is co-author of the o Oxford Pocket Guide to Regional Anesthesia. David is a senior instructor in ATLS, CRISP and directs DATC, which is the Definitive Anesthesia Trauma Care and is a graduate of the Australian Institute of Company Directors. He was an appointed and an adjunct associate professor at the University of Western Sydney in 2015. So David's task is to present the Geoffrey K Lecture. The title, Hamel, Monash and 100, 100 Years, What Can We Learn? Thanks David. Thank you Peter. Uh, this is almost the last official role I have to complete as president of the ASA. Um, every past president has come up to me and we said, we know how you feel. So uh, today, I'd like to take you back 100 years to 1918. And drawing on the contributions to the end of the Great War by one of Australia's greatest leaders, General Sir John Monash. I will commence, however, in the middle of the last century for Geoffrey Kay, who he was, and why this oration is named for him. After Monash, I will move on to today and what we as a specialty and as a society might learn from John Monash and his contributions. And then I will finish up with a brief summary of S Sir John's contributions after Hamel to the end of the war and to the end of his life. I ask you to remember the service given by all Australians to their country and to note that today is October the 8th and it is now 10.30 and that will become apparent later. This presentation includes four short videos. So let's see if I can get this to work. Here's a summary of what we're going to be doing. And let me introduce Geoffrey Kay. Geoffrey Alfred Kay, anaesthetist, was born on the 9th of April 1903 in Melbourne, of Prussian and Victorian-born family. He was educated in England and studied medicine at the University of Melbourne. As RMO at the Alfred Hospital, he had decided to specialise in the field of anaesthetics in 1927, and three years later he was appointed an honorary anaesthetist at the Alfred Hospital. After his appointment, he travelled to the United Kingdom, Germany and North America, developing knowledge and networks. After travelling, Kay set out to improve the science of anaesthesia in Australia. He wrote textbooks, lectured, travelled, and as a result of his lobbying, helped establish the Australian Society of Anaesthetists in 1934. He was one of seven founders. He started as secretary and newsletter editor of the ASA, and in 1939, he completed a diploma of anaesthesia, jointly awarded by the 
English Royal Colleges of Surgeons and Physicians in London. In 1937, Kay worked on the design and manufacture of anaesthesia equipment for the Australian military forces. He was appointed a captain in the Australian Army Medical Corps and he served two years in the Middle East with the 2nd, 2nd Australian General Hospital and he was appointed advisor in anaesthetics for the AIF. He is described as formal in style, tall, lean and idealistic. He was a man of incisive mind and complex personality, reserved, demanding, sometimes intemperate and unforgiving, but capable on closer acquaintance of generosity and warmth. He is considered a visionary in the specialty of anaesthesia in Australia, seeking to establish an anaesthesia research institute to develop the science of anaesthesia and to make Australia a leader in the field. He was elected an honorary life member of the ASA in 1944. He collaborated with Robert Orton and Douglas Renton in writing the book Anaesthetic Methods in 1946. In 1949, he was elected a Fellow of the Faculty of Anaesthetists, Royal College of Surgeons. He sought full national professional representation of anaesthetists and he vigorously opposed moves to amalgamate the ASA within the Royal Australian College of Surgeons. However, he acquiesced in election as a Foundation Fellow of the Faculty of Anaesthetists, RACS, in 1952. Kay had a particular interest in the history of anaesthesia equipment and was curator of a museum for the ASA. In 1958, the museum was named in his honour, becoming a lasting monument to his work, which is now at the college headquarters in Melbourne. In 1974, he received the Orton Medal from the Faculty of Anaesthetists. On the 50th anniversary of the founding of the ASA in 1984, he addressed an international meeting of anaesthetists at the Sydney Opera House. He never married and he died on the 28th of October 1986. A great Australian anaesthetist, inventor, educator, researcher, author, historian and visionary. This is why this oration is named for Geoffrey Kay. Do you like that? My lips didn't move once the whole time. Uh, so then to get on to what I'm here to talk about really, which starts with the Battle of Hamel. And Hamel is a small hamlet in the Somme Valley of France, and you've probably all heard of the Battle of the Somme and of the terrible losses that occurred in that time. Uh, what I'm going to do now is play another video to introduce John Monash and give a brief account of the Battle of Hamel, which was fought in July 1918, so just over 100 years ago. Before midnight on the 3rd of July 1918, Australian diggers, American infantry and the Allied tanks were silently moving into position around the French village of Hamel. The opposing forces were hunkering down in preparation for the now routine barrage of heavy shelling they expected at dawn. The infantry, artillery, armour and the Air Corps had been preparing for weeks for this day. Their general, Sir John Monash, the man on the hundred dollar bill, an engineer by profession, a citizen soldier and a veteran of Gallipoli had been planning this battle meticulously. The war in France had been dragging on in a relative stalemate since the Allies stopped the initial German assault in 1914. The Allies and the German generals had repeatedly attempted frontal assaults against the trenches with limited results apart from the terrible slaughter of men. The Germans had recently completed a major offensive in March 1918 with the troops they had recently acquired from the now cancelled Russian front and had hoped to reach an armistice before the Americans got into the war in large numbers. The Allies were on the defensive as they had a poor record of winning battles. Tens of thousands of lives had been wasted in failed offensives like the Somme, Ypres and Passchendaele. Both sides were doing the same thing, throwing men at machine guns, wire and artillery and hoping for a breakthrough. 
Einstein described insanity as doing exactly the same thing and expecting a different result. So, World War I was mostly insanity. It took a reservist engineer, not a professional soldier, to show how to end that insanity. It is said that the first casualty of a set battle is the plan, because it never goes as planned. Monash, however, had a different plan. He used the latest technology, aircraft, artillery, mechanised armour or tanks, telephone communication harmonised in a coordinated way to produce a combined effect and protect the infantrymen. This provided real-time communication from the battlefield which allowed him to respond in an agile fashion to the events of the battle and make strategic changes to achieve his objectives. His plan was not a casualty because he planned to change it as the battle developed. To us today this seems sensible, logical and obvious. Then it was revolutionary. His plan was to take 90 minutes to complete and to minimise casualties with all objectives achieved. He made sure his troops trained together with the tanks, which from previous experience they had didn't trust. He made sure that everybody right down to the corporals in the infantry knew the terrain, the objectives and the plan through to completion of their part. Everybody was primed and prepared for the battle. Planning was detailed. Troop resupply by tank and aircraft was in place. Aerial mapping of the battle's progress and informing command was in place. Care of the wounded was prepared and nothing was left to chance. Afterwards, troops commented his plan was so thorough that hot meals were even delivered to them soon after the battle. Monash had planned to augment his forces with United States troops who were freshly arrived to the front. His plan was agreed to by General Headquarters and General Haig and immediately before the battle General Pershing was made aware that his troops would be fighting under the command of a foreign general and sought to have them withdrawn, even though they had been training together. Fortunately, Monash outmaneuvered the Americans and General Rawlinson and got to keep the thousand US troops. In fact, this was the beginning of a long association between the United States and Australian military working and training together in conflicts around the world including World War II, Korea, Vietnam and the Middle East today. The battle commenced with a rolling barrage by artillery and coloured smoke shells imitating gas, forcing the enemy to take cover. And the diggers and the tanks advanced behind the bombardment. Once they reached the trenches, they silenced the machine guns and overwhelmed the defenders. It was hard hand-to-hand -hand fighting like seen in Gallipoli, but rarely on the front as machine guns stopped them before they got there. What made this battle different was that Monash knew what was happening. Unlike previous battles where the generals sat back and waited or wandered behind the trenches out of contact while the troops fought and died, Monash was immediately updated on the progress of the battle. He was hands-on making changes and directing movements of troops and supplies to support his men in the unfolding battle. At 3.14am on the 4th of July 1918, the most well-prepared battle in the First World War began with artillery barrage. The preparation and training for the Battle of Hamel was so great that all objectives were taken within 93 minutes of the battle starting, with less than 1,400 casualties. The mostly Australian troops, led by Monash, who believed that a battle could be won only after a great deal of preparation, fought with distinction. So, with this battle and its preparation, came some firsts for the Great War. For the first time, tanks were used to supply the front troops with water, food, ammunition and medical supplies. Tanks were also used as a moving wall to protect the troops. The use of tanks in these ways gave the Allies a definite advantage over the enemy. Another first was the way that Monash used the Air Force. Leading up to the battle, he frequently sent planes over the German lines, photographing their positions so that accurate maps could be prepared and the enemy troop disposition was known. 
He used their noise to mask the sounds of tanks being brought forward. During the battle, planes dropped ammunition to the forward troops and after the battle was won, the Australians in the front line lit flares so that new maps could be drawn to show the new Allied front. The maps were then dropped to Monash back at headquarters. In the nights leading up to the battle, raids were carried out along the German front line. When the battle began, the German troops were expecting just another small raid and were not prepared for a battle. Compared to other battles, the Battle of Hamel was not large, but what makes it so special is that for the first time in many months, the Allies began to think and move offensively. It is for this reason that some people believe that the Battle of Hamel was the beginning of the end of the war. This was the first time that Australians were primarily commanded by an Australian in World War I. This was the first time Americans fought with Australians. 1,600 German troops were captured along with much of their equipment. Around 2,000 were killed. While small in scale, the Battle of Hamel was to have far-reaching consequences for trench warfare. Because it provided a practical demonstration of tactics for attacking an entrenched enemy using combined arms tactics. The strategy employed at Hamel was then successful on a much larger scale at the Battle of Amiens and was a major factor in the Allied successes later in the war. Despite the concerns of the Australian infantry, all but three of the British tanks, although initially delayed, eventually reached their objectives. At least five of the Allied tanks were damaged during the attack, but these were later repaired and casualties amongst the British tank crews were minimal. Australian casualties were considered light in the context of a war. The attack was considered extremely successful for the Australians. A large quantity of British equipment that had been captured by the Germans when they had taken Hamel in April was also recovered. The four American companies that joined the Australians during the assault were withdrawn from the line after the battle and returned to their regiments, having gained valuable experience. Monash sent US General Bell his personal thanks and praised the Americans' gallantry, while Pershing sent out explicit instructions to ensure that US troops would not be employed in a similar manner again. This was ignored. They would subsequently play a significant role in the fighting that followed right up until the end of the war, as US reinforcements came to tip the manpower balance in favour of the Allies. Two Australians were awarded the Victoria Cross for their conduct during the battle. Fourteen Americans were awarded British medals. One corporal was awarded the medal personally by King George V on the 12th of August 1918. He would later also receive the Medal of Honour. He and seven others were also awarded the US Army's Distinguished Service Cross for actions during the Battle of Hamel. Hamel became the template for all future Allied offensives on the front in World War I. General Monash was knighted in the field by the King the first time in 300 years that this had happened. And history would go on to regard him as possibly the greatest and best military generals of World War I. Field Marshal Bernard Montgomery, the World War II British Army commander, described Monash as the best World War I general on the Western Front in Europe, on either side. So, quite a remarkable feat uh, to turn the tide of a war in one small battle. He achieved this through communication, coordination and collaboration and he completely changed the paradigm of what trench warfare had been up until that time. So I just want to share now just a little bit more about who General Sir John Monash was, where he came from, and how he got to be in the position that he was. General Sir John Monash, Knight Grand Cross of the Order of St Michael and St George, Knight Commander of the Order of the Bath, was a civil engineer and the leading Australian military commander of the First World War. 
He was born in Melbourne in June 1865 of East Prussian Jewish parents. He was raised mostly in Richmond, although he did spend a year in Gerildry in the Riverina, and was educated at Scotch Grammar School, where the progressive headmaster accepted bright boys from all backgrounds. He excelled in mathematics and science and distinguished himself at school. He went on to Melbourne University to study science, humanities and engineering. After completing his engineering degree, Monash was involved in the construction of the Princess Bridge over the Yarra in 1884. He was the engineer in charge of the construction of the suburban Outer Circle Rail Line in 1887 and in 1892 he was appointed Assistant Engineer and Chief Draftsman for the Melbourne Harbour Trust. While at university he joined the University Regiment and commenced his military training. He commanded the 13th Infantry Brigade before the war began and then shortly after its outbreak became commander of the 4th Brigade in Egypt, with whom he took part in the Gallipoli campaign from day one. In July 1916, he took charge of the newly raised 3rd Division in northwestern France and in May 1918 became commander of the Australian Corps, at the time the largest corps on the Western Front. The successful Allied attack at the Battle of Amiens on the 8th of August 1818, which expedited the end of the war, was planned by Monash and spearheaded by the British forces including the Australian and Canadian Corps under Monash and Arthur Curry. Monash is considered one of the best Allied generals of the First World War and the most famous commander in Australian history. And I wonder uh, if we were alive today if we'd still be asking him to be dictator of Australia. Um, he certainly was a remarkable man. So part of today's presentation was to pay tribute to the men and women of the ADF who served in World War I on almost the centenary of the armistice of the, that ended the Great War. A four-year war which took over or more than 60,000 Australian lives and left hundreds of thousands more severely affected, both the men and women who served and also their families back home. It was a life-altering and life-diminishing experience for many, many Australians. I would now ask you to consider what we might learn from General Monash and his leadership. None of this was easy for him. Where are we going to go? Wrong button. There we go. Um, Monash had to face many personal and professional challenges to achieve what he did. He had to overcome five levels of discrimination. He was of German heritage. He was born of East Prussian parents. And those of you who are paying, paying attention, you'll also notice that Geoffrey Kay was born of East Prussian parentage. Um, he was not regular army, and that is still an interesting problem today for some reservists. He was Jewish, and in Australia, and particularly in Melbourne at that time, anti-Semitism was quite pronounced. He was from a Dominion country, and so the British generals felt that he would not be able to lead as well as a British uh, officer could. And he had adversaries back in Australia who would spread subversive rumours about him like he was a German spy or something like that, which is really quite interesting since he was the one who defeated more Germans than anyone else. He thought very differently about fighting wars and said, I have formed the theory that the true role of the infantry is not to expend itself upon heroic physical effort nor to wither away under the merciless machine gun fire, nor to impale itself on hostile bayonets, nor tear itself to pieces in hostile entanglements. Instead, he wanted his troops to advance under the maximum possible protection of the maximum possible array of mechanical resources in the form of guns, mortars, aeroplanes, tanks, to advance as with, with as little impediment as possible and to be relieved as far as possible from the obligation of having to fight their way forward. Prior to this, no general on either side had thought this was the way to fight this war. So why did his plan work? Well, I think it worked for the reasons that I've listed there. 
communication, collaboration, preparation and innovation, disruptive thinking, and, dare I say it, professional citizenship. So we're going to go through each of those issues. Communication is probably the most important thing to consider here. If we examine almost anything that's gone wrong in the history of the world, one of the main contributing factors was poor communication. If the Titanic had good communication with the ships around it, most of the doomed passengers would have been rescued because they saw the fireworks going off, the flares going off, but they thought they were just having a party. She took three hours to sink. Most of those lives could have been saved. The terrible aircraft crash that happened at Tenerife in 1977 and took 583 lives would have been avoided if the aircrew had have followed crew resource management policies, which are now in place, uh, as a result of that crash, and had warned the senior captain not to move on to the taxiway. Maybe if Barnaby Joyce had have communicated that he hadn't had a vasectomy. Who knows? During the process of what was the MBS review for anaesthesia, the outcome could have been completely different if the Anaesthesia Clinical Committee had have communicated with colleagues as they were instructed to do. The ASA working group strove very hard with limited information from the Anaesthesia Clinical Committee to determine the trajectory of their deliberations. And through effective communications with the Health Minister Greg Hunt, his advisers, AMA President Michael Gannon and the Department of Health has managed to redirect the process of the MBS review and prevent what we believe would have been uh, destructive and inappropriate changes being made. Changes which would have significantly diminished rebates to what we estimate over 1.2 million of our patients. The ASA, along with the New Zealand Society of Anaesthetists, the college, has opened the debate on our specialty's name. Our name communicated to our patients and to the world is one of who we are and what we do. Today, most of the world uses the term anesthesiologist to describe a medical practitioner who delivers anesthesia. In fact, only Australia, New Zealand and the United Kingdom are the countries that use anesthetist to describe that term. The Irish voted in May to change their college name to the anesthesiologists. The World Federation Society of Anesthetists, an organisation of which the ASA is a founding member, defines the term anesthesiologist and notes that in most countries uh, this is the term that's used. Surely it's time for us to consider joining the rest of the world. I don't believe it's Americanisation, I just believe it's joining the global community. This is a conversation I think we need to continue. In truth, many of our patients already differentiate anesthesiologists and anaesthetists because they watch television medical dramas where when everything turns to custard, there's always an anesthesiologist there to save the day. I guess most superheroes behave in a similar fashion. Mind you, I don't think I'll start wearing a cape or wearing my underpants on the outside just yet. I think this debate needs to be held. I think it needs to be continued. The outcome is about having our specialty and other specialists in the wider healthcare system and the public understand our important role for caring for our patients. It's not so much about differentiating us from alternative anaesthesia providers, although that is a consideration. It's rather about promoting an understanding of the key role of anaesthesia in the holistic care of patients as they move through their perioperative experience from their GPs through surgery and then back into normal life. Collaboration, another one of Monash's key achievements. Just as Monash saw the solution to overcoming the enemy was through collaboration with combined forces of both the Australian military, the Allied forces, so the ASA has been working to collaborate. The MBS review, the Minister's out-of-pocket review, the Private Health Insurance review, the Medical Board of Australia's revalidation review, to name but a few, have threatened the specialty in significant ways during my time as President. And have all required us to collaborate with other specialties, other organisations, government organisations, and allowed us to work together, I think, to produce the best outcome for the specialty and for our patients, and has kept me very busy over the last two years. The ASA has collaborated closely with the AMA, the Department of Health, the Minister for Health, senior leadership within ANSCA, key leaders in the ASA, and with academics to fight the MBS review recommendations, 
in what has been described by some as the greatest existential threat to the society in a, for a very long time. This group has worked tirelessly over the last two years to ensure that the interest of our patients and the fee-for-service model for anaesthesia provision has remained intact and viable. We've worked closely with the Federal Department of Health uh, to help understand how the ill-informed and misguided recommendations from the MBS Review Anaesthesia Clinical Committee would have been both harmful and inappropriate to our patients. How the clinical committee impugned the specialty and denigrated the importance of appropriate application of individualised evidence-based care, accusing us of doing it for the money. Analysis of data by the ASA, of department data, um, has shown that not only are anaesthetists practising good evidence-based medicine, but they completely refuted the assertion that we're just doing it for the money. On multiple occasions, they suggested many of the treatments instituted by us as part of individualised care were just for the financial compensation. They called this a perverse incentive. And they used their term in their first report seven different times. With the objections from the ASA and the college, the perverse incentive term has been altered, but the intent to suggest that these items were claimed only because there was money for performing them remained. When we examined this data, quite the contrary was revealed. As an example, arterial lines. It was suggested that we only do these because we get paid for it. Despite the fact that there is good evidence that even brief periods of hypotension in the elderly is associated with higher rates of perioperative myocardial infarction, and thus arterial line insertion of nearly a 30% increase over the last five years uh, is easily explained by the fact that we have seen a 27% increase in the number of patients over the age of 70 having operations of more than two hours and a 47% increase in the number of patients over 80 having operations of more than two hours. I wouldn't call this a perverse incentive. I'd call this good medicine practised by you, uh, the, the anaesthetists of Australia. So these suggestions of rotting have been completely inappropriate. It was even suggestions, and I call this a Trumpism, it was suggestions that everyone knows someone who puts arterial lines in for knee, knee arthroscopy. And everyone knows, nods, yeah, yeah. But in fact, does anyone in this room know anyone who does that? Because I certainly don't. And when we examined those numbers through the Department of Health data, there was only seven occasions where the item number for arthroscopy was associated with an arterial line. And I don't find it too hard to imagine that in a year there could be seven very septic patients who need an arthroscopic washout. So to me, this is a lack of evidence of systemic gaming of the system and in fact validation of good medical practice done by our specialty. Thanks to the dedicated and prolonged hard work of the ASA and its collaborators, we have averted what we believe would have been a disaster and would have seen cuts, as I said before, to over 1.2 million patients, inappropriately bundled, bundled payments for others. The ASA has worked hard with the Department and the Minister to ensure that responsible stewardship of the RVG will continue into the future, but it should be with the ASA as the key stakeholders, not some other committee pulled together of people who don't represent our specialty appropriately. We hope to look forward to an announcement from the Minister sometime before the end of the year, which will finalise this process. And once that's done, I'll be able to share with the specialty, uh, the ASA will be able to share with the specialty um, the, the outcomes. Clearly, responsible stewardship of the schedule must continue to be the role of the ASA in collaboration with the college and appropriate academics in the Department of Health. Preparation and innovation, another great achievement by Monash. And one of his strengths was his logical mind and his training in engineering. He understood the complexity of a si complexities of a system with many interdependent components. He appreciated how to orchestrate all of the different tools available to him into a symphony which could be used to build a bridge or win a battle against a stubborn and entrenched opponent. He also understood that careful planning is required to complete such a task and that if just one step is omitted or one component neglected, it could mean the difference between success and failure. This was something not appreciated by other World War I generals and as part of writing the symphony and preparing for the battle, Monash held conferences with his subordinate commanders 
where every aspect of the plan was discussed and critiqued. Every leader had input to the final plan, so they all had ownership. This was very different to most other battles. So too, with leading an organisation like the ASA, any problem that is presented to us must be considered as a complex situation. We are fortunate that we have a leadership structure which has evolved to assist us. The principal committees of professional issues, public practice, economics advisories and communications uh, allow us to address many of these issues with a dedicated uh, and competent and very skilled group of people. This process of consultation has led to robust decision making and comprehensive considerations of issues and I have to acknowledge and thank the leaders of our committees who have been so productive and so helpful in dealing with these changes over the last two years. Also support from the head office. I'm now going to talk about disruptive thinking. When Monash conducted the Battle of Hamel, he did it in a completely new way, using all the techniques described. And the Australian troops reached the enemy lines while they were still hiding for the artillery to end so they could set up their machine guns. It was an almost complete surprise. This is what today we would call disruptive thinking. Um, and disruptive thinking has been credited as one of the reasons why new conservatives like Trump have been elected. Probably not a good thing, but depending on your politics, but it was effective. So what are the aspects of disruptive thinking that we need to consider? I think a mindset to discard old cliches and remake the landscape and never accept the status quo. You know, the specialty of anaesthesia must be looking to do this. The future of the specialty is in our hands at the moment. It is the responsibility of the society and the college to ensure that we as specialist doctors continue to provide a comprehensive service for perioperative care that represents good value for our patients and fund players. To achieve this, we must be prepared to consider all options for work styles and payment to ensure that we are able to work independently and maintain the current world's best high standards of anaesthesia care. Perioperative medicine must become a role that we advocate for and we must guide it. New models of care around the surgical experience are arising and it is crucial that anaesthetists, anaesthetists are leaders and clinicians who lead. Opportunities for extending post-operative care led by anaesthetists are currently being researched here in Adelaide and I believe will lead to better outcomes for our patients, will save resources, will save costs and will save lives. We, as a specialty, has to look, working, look to working outside of the operating room and to lead these innovative changes or we do run the risk of being relegated to technicians. Another key to disruptive thinking requires realistic thinking, discarding old trends, but keeping within a scope of what we do. This represents one of the challenges for our society, society and the specialty. Anesthesia, like emergency medicine, radiology, pathology, plays a crucial role in the care of our patients, yet it is not often well understood by the general public. Many people believe we have an image issue and that patients um, with patients and in some cases other specialties. We all at times struggle for the recognition we feel we deserve. And yet at times our level of inability, or as Kester Brown described it, mystery, um, works to our advantage. Our patients rarely tell us what sort of anaesthetic they need. Dr Google is generally not very helpful in telling them how to tell us what to do. Uh, and the complex nature of what we do is something, oh, somewhat of a black box to most people. And most of the surgeons we work with really don't get what we do either. It has been said that we need to elevate the profile of the specialty in order to get the respect we feel we deserve. I don't disagree, but a word of caution. This needs to be done in a way that truly enhances people's understanding of what it is we do, because clearly we run the risk that if it's not done well, the public and the journalists will just view us as wanting to get more money. So how then do we achieve this outcome? Well, it's interesting, recent events in Thailand of the cave rescues um, and their exploits uh, by the exploits by Dr Harris have probably done more positive work for the profile of the specialty than any campaign spending millions of dollars. This work in so many ways was the work of anaesthesia and perioperative medicine. The surgery was actually the extrication out of the caves. 
I think the society and the college need to be able to articulate our value, demonstrate leadership by tackling important issues like inappropriate opiate usage, or the difference we make to patient outcome by extending PACU care to help the public and our colleagues understand our commitment to the community. This sort of action will raise our profile without raising accusations of greed. The next one is we need to have a leadership mindset. We need to move away from the PAC and make the PAC follow us. And our society must be able to be prepared to go onto the front foot with policy for our advocacy. So much energy over the last two years has been expended, extended sorry, in response to external threats. The MBS review, the minister's out-of-pocket review, the private health insurance, to name but a few, much of this has been driven by politically funded think tanks um, and those who have peddled their own views. The Australian healthcare system um, is actually a very good system. These people are trying to criticise it and claiming that they have balanced and scientific views. Right now, our healthcare system produces some of the best outcomes in the world. While being below average cost um, as part of uh, GDP to most other OECD countries. Surely this represents good value. I believe collaboration with like-minded societies and associations in the AMA is vital in this space and we need to be changing the dialogue so that the political pact isn't being steered by people with other agendas. And until we, and until we do this, we will continue to be attacked by external agencies. Radical thinking and often using technology as an enabler. As part of our brand renewal of the website reconstruction, we have sought to, so, sought to show leadership in the professional delivery of anaesthesia services, particularly in the areas of informed financial agreement and patient satisfaction. And the ASA is collaborating with Avant to develop resources on the ideal ways of obtaining informed financial agreement and how this should be recorded. We are developing with developing technologies to provide members tools for informed financial agreement and for patient feedback, which will facilitate the members' CME activities for quality assurance, and at the same time provide the ASA with de-identified pooled data attesting to the levels of satisfaction and quality of anaesthesia care delivery in this country. Unsubstantiated derisive comments that have been used against the specialty, particularly by the Anaesthesia Clinical Committee, over the last two years would have been used to cut funding to our specialty. We need to be able to counter those accusations with facts. <coughs> it's in the mind. Just don't think outside the box. Think there is no box. So the key to successful disruptive thinking is the disruptive constructive model, which I'm not sure that all politicians use. We need to jointly sit and reconstruct a new box. And this is what Monash did. He used new ideas and technology to disrupt the conventional thinking of the day. He then collaborated with his leaders and subordinates to make a new paradigm of warfighting. So too, we must learn as a specialty in a society to do this. We must learn to work constructively and collaboratively with each other and outside agencies to develop new ways of approaching the apparently never-ending tax we are facing from lobby groups, profit-taking insurers and so-called think tanks, whose real agenda is often politically based and motivated. What does our new box look like? Well, I'm not sure. But I believe that anesthesiology could be part of that. Anesthesiology is an all-encompassing term for the perioperative physician who provides the comprehensive preoperative preparation and assessment, the skilled intraoperative care for an increasingly elderly and sick population, and the careful ongoing care extended into the post-anesthesia care unit for the unstable patient. Our challenge is to make this happen and to ensure that it's funded appropriately in the private and public sector and to ensure that the savings we generate come back to us as appropriate compensation for the work that's done. Monash also had demonstrated professional citizenship. And this is defined as the willingness to accept the responsibility and ownership for the present and future state. To achieve this, you have to be a team player, demonstrating both leadership and followership. You have to always do your fair share of the work, lead by example, and always stand up for and doing the right thing. It's about giving back as well as, as, well as taking, 
and supporting your mission with your time and your energy. Monash saw this, saw his present state was parlous and needed to be changed. He had the vision to see what that change should look like and he set about making it happen. Anesthesia as a specialty in many ways needs to do the same thing. Our future state is one where we are in control of our destiny and the specialty, where we are leading the way to better outcomes for our patients, better value for our funders and the government. This requires all of us to think about how we deliver our high quality care and how we may innovate and cooperate even better. Over the last two years as president, this has been one of my goals. How can the ASA lead the specialty to greater engagement with policy makers, fund holders and statutory bodies? And we have engaged at every opportunity to represent the specialty and the membership. We have made sure that we are at the table and not on the menu. I've been asked why do we need a society in this day and age? And to me, the answer, the answer is, is obvious. So when you all go home after this or when you travel somewhere, you get on an aeroplane and you don't think for a second, what if this plane crashes and I don't get home? More likely you're going to think about, I wonder what the in-flight entertainment is or I wonder what I'm going to get fed or I wish that damn kid had stopped kicking the seat behind me. So why is that? It's due to two things. It's due to an organisation like Air Services Australia, which is an Australian government-owned corporation, which regulates to ensure airworthiness of aircraft and regulates air traffic control to ensure collisions are avoided. The Bureau of Meteorology provides accurate weather information to AirQ to also ensure safe navigation. And secondly, it's the Pilots Association and the Cabin Attendants Association to ensure good working conditions so that the air crew are not fatigued or working two jobs to pay the bills and are able to effectively focus on the crucial role of the human component of flying. So these two pillars of safety are the regulators, which is Air Services Australia, and the people, which is the professional association. So when we take our patients on a journey from their lifelong care of their GP through the detour of surgery, and I see us as biggles here. We, we uh, and, back to, and back to that same level of confidence. Sometimes, however, the patient, unlike the aircraft we get in to go home, is already injured or is crashing and is not functioning well. So we have to take our aircraft off, despite the fact that we probably shouldn't, because we have to, and that's the only way it's going to land safely at the other end. I guess the other big difference between us and pilots, of course, is if the aeroplane does crash, we don't go down with the ship. So Australia anesthesia, Australian anaesthesia has an excellent safety record for exactly the same reasons. Regulation and training governed by the college produces the highest quality specialist set standards on equipment, staffing, facilities to ensure the safest environments for anaesthesia delivery and the ASA has long advocated for appropriate remuneration conditions to ensure anaesthetists are suitably supported. And so they don't have to work excessive hours to pay their costs. These can, the conditions in the private sector then influence the industry and so raise the benchmark for the public specialists. So what we achieve for one group balances out against the other. So our two pillars are the standards of care, which is the college, and the wellness of our people, which is society. The ASA is all about making sure that when things don't go to plan, we're like Sully. We land the aircraft and we save the people. So I'm just going to go now into covering some of the things we've been facing in the last two years, and there's quite a list of them there. The governance restructure uh, was the first thing that I took on, and that was where we changed our structure from a board and a board within a board to now a board and a council. And I have to say that at our last board meeting on Friday, we had a great meeting. The board now focuses on the operational issues of the society and make sure that it's well managed and well funded. And the council is now our strategic arm. It's the group that sits down and works out what the society is going to do and how we're going to best represent you, the membership and the specialty, 
to all of the people that we need to interact with. We engage with Credit Suisse to uh, secure our investments, which are now doing very well. Uh, the MBS review I've already talked about. Uh, we've had a branding refresh. Uh, the Anesthesia and Intensive Care Journal uh, is going to be outsourced as part of our improved risk management and improved value for our members. Uh, we've had a website refresh, which I've talked about. We've adopted an equity and diversity policy, and that is going to be in the DNA of the society. It's not something we're going to crow about particularly, but it's how we're going to do business from now on. We've engaged, engaged with the obstetricians on working out better value for private obstetric services. We've worked with the health minister and the chief medical officer in dealing with medical out-of-pocket expenses. We've worked with the college on the rural anaesthesia workforce. We've collaborated with the college and with the surgeons and the New Zealand Society with the emergency laparotomy audit. We've worked with the wellbeing of anaesthetists or wellness of anaesthetists special interest group in developing the EveryMind project, which um, I had up as a, uh, a QR code uh, on the first day. And I do encourage you to go to the website and just go to the ASA website. It'll be on one of the opening banners. Click on it and get your heads of departments, both in public and private, to adopt, well, at least to take on the toolkit and look at how you might ensure that the people in your department are better looked after. And we normalise mental health care within our anaesthesia departments. <coughs> I've represented the ASA at the Common Interest Group meetings, and we've engaged with the European Society of Anesthesiologists and signed a memorandum of understanding to enable closer cooperation between our two societies. I also had the honour of reappointing the CEO of the ASA, and I'm very pleased to say that Mark Carmichael has stayed on for another couple of years. He's doing an outstanding job. We've collaborated with Interplast Australia, the New Zealand Society and the College in signing a new memorandum of understanding in the ongoing support of the Lifebox campaign. We signed that yesterday. And we've held discussions with the My Health Record about how My Health Record access for us can be managed better. Uh, I don't think they understood how anaesthetists work and how we would want to access the My Health Record for our patients, what device we would need to use to do it, and what sort of information should be on it. So they've gone away sharpened up their pencils and are working out how we might be able to tailor it for use for anaesthetists. It's not an exhausting list. It's not an exhaustive list, but it does cover most of the issues. Going into the future, the importance of active ad advocacy with government and fund payers, as well as active collaboration to ensure ongoing improvement in quality and safety for anaesthesia is one of the key roles that the ASA will continue to undertake. So in closing and in keeping with the military theme, I want to thank a number of people who have helped with this fairly tiresome list of activities. I'd like to start with the officer in charge at home, my wife Rachel, who generously agreed to me taking on this challenging role. She's been there through the whole thing and I'm sure if she never hears of the MBS review again, it will be too soon. The next would be my number two, Mr Mark Carmichael who skillfully redirected me when I needed it and supported me when I was on the right track. I'd like to thank the, the troops of the headquarters division, Sue Donovan and all of her people, who make everything happen so seamlessly that I am continually amazed. I'd like to thank the ASA board, a finer group of officers you won't find. In particular, I'd like to thank the retiring general, uh, past president Guy Christie Taylor, who has been one of my most valued sounding boards. I'd like to thank the incoming general, Peter Seal, who has kept me focused and on track and who brings a different view, which is really important within an organisation like ours. Group think is very dangerous. I'd like to thank Andrew Miller for his sharp mind and wit, which lets nothing get past him. And I'd like to thank the executive councillor, Susie New, an impressive worker with a very sharp mind and a future leader. I'd also like to thank the leaders of our principal committees, like platoon leaders. They've worked hard to keep their teams uh, working to produce strong advice and reports that represent the society. In particular, Mark Sinclair, as chair of the Economics Advisory Committee, 
Antonio Grossi, Chair of the Professional Issues Advisory Committee, Committee, and Alicia Dennis of the Public Practice Advisory Committee. I also want to particularly thank the group, this group for their incredible hard work in responding to the MBS review. I'm not sure if anyone but myself and Mark Carmichael appreciates just how much work has been put in by these people. And they include past president and, let me say it, relative value guide genius, Andrew Mulcahy, in collaboration with Professor David A. Scott, Dr. Philippa Hoare, and the independent Professor David Storey. Through the work of this excellent team, it's safe to say, I believe, that a disaster has been averted, and I believe we'll be ushering in a new era of deliberate consultation and collaboration with the department to ensure that the schedule will be appropriately maintained. Final words not out yet, but I think we're almost there. It's also important to thank, I think, our chief editor, John Loadsman, and to all the other captains and corporals within the ASA leadership roles. We're now gonna go back to John Monash and just let you, what hap let you know what happened after the Battle of Hamel. From the start of the Battle of Hamel through to the planned withdrawal of the Australian Corps from the front line some three months later, Monash led the Allies through a remarkable series of battles which were all successful, with objectives achieved beyond the wildest dreams of the Allied command. From the 4th of July to the 5th of October 1918, the Australian Corps had been in almost constant battle. During that time, they had taken almost 30,000 prisoners, liberated 116 towns and villages, recaptured 660 square kilometres, and the Germans suffered in the order of 60,000 fatalities. In that same time period, the Australians lost 5,500 killed, 24,000 wounded. This was the least costly period for the Australians for the whole war, despite the fact that they were the spearhead for the battles. They had taken on 39 enemy divisions and beaten them all, including the crack Prussian guards. Well before their attack in March, the Germans knew to stay away from the Dominion troops. After the 8th of August, the German commanders admitted that the combination of tanks and Australians was overwhelming. The key reason for this success was the brilliance of Monash in placing the emphasis on machinery and weapons to protect the infantry without diminishing their role. His ideas and strategies caused the Australians to stand out from the rest of the combatants on either side. This marked a change in warfare and ended the concept that men were cannon fodder. His detailed command of technology, machinery and equipment put his thinking 50 years ahead of every other commander. That he was in a position to put his ideas into practice with devastating effect on the enemy is a tribute to his drive, vision and tenacity. On October the 5th, the Australians were withdrawn from the front line for a well-deserved rest. On the same day, Prince Max von Baden, on behalf of the German government, asked for an immediate armistice. The fighting continued for another month, but the enemy had no line of defence in France, and were continually on the retreat from then on. After the war, Monash wrote of the decisive role the Australian Corps played in the 1918 Allied campaign, giving it five stages. He said, stopping the German offensive in March, turning the German offence into defence, commencing the offensive thrust from Hamel onto Amiens and the great initial and irredeemable defeat, preventing the Germans from resting after defeat at Amiens and pushing them from the Somme, thus preventing the war continuing till 1919, and overthrowing the great defensive system of the Hindenburg Line, thus preventing the Germans from bargaining on their terms. After the armistice of November the 11th, 1918, there were thousands of Australians in Europe who had to get home. The Prime Minister, Billy Hughes, was keen to get them home, for there was an election in 1919. But he was afraid of Monash, who he feared would make a formidable opponent. So he arranged for Monash to be in charge of the repatriation and of keeping the troops occupied in England till they could get a ship home, and till after the federal elections. Monash made sure the fourth Anzac Day would be celebrated in London when 5,000 diggers marched five kilometres through the city, taking the salute from the Prince of Wales, Hague and Chevelle. 
Hughes was there as well, though not enjoying playing second fiddle to Monash. Monash returned to Melbourne December the 26th, 1919, where the Prime Minister Hughes failed to meet him. The Governor-General, Munro Ferguson, also failed to meet him, and General Birdwood, his old commander who he now outranked, also failed to meet him. They were terrified of him, and they could not accept that a native-born Australian could be smarter, more educated and articulate, and be a better leader and have a finer military skill than any Englishman. After returning to Australia, he was invited to hundreds of events to praise him and his achievements. Sadly, his wife, Vic, fell ill and passed away the next February, which left him devastated. After this, he's found his real role as a senior advocate for the Anzacs. He laid the cornerstone for Anzac House in Melbourne, lectured at the Australian War Memorial, and was in constant demand from the press for comment. Hughes, the Army and the Governor-General continued to ignore him and deliberately snubbed him from high office, military promotion or recognition. The British generals after the war got large sums of money and titles. Even Birdwood was given a title. The Canadian General Curry got some recognition after complaining. They let Monash keep his sword. In 1920, he took over and set up the Victorian State Electricity Commission and almost single-handedly, through the SEC, set up electricity generation and distribution for the state. He was also instrumental in the building and designs of the Melbourne Shrine of Remembrance and remained an advocate for the diggers' welfare until he died. At 10.55am on the 8th of October 1931, exactly 87 years ago today. So, half an hour ago. So, uh, I'd like to thank you for your indulgence and attention. I trust you found this engaging, entertaining and educational. I thank you also, the servicemen and women, past and present, present for your sacrifice to your country and for those who paid the ultimate price, and the families and the loved ones who were left behind to pick up the pieces. Finally, I wish to express my appreciation to the Australian Society of Anaesthetists for trusting me with the duties of President. I've appreciated this trust and the responsibility placed by you in me, the members, and I've always attempted to do the right thing in representing you, the members, and what is right for the specialty as my guide. It has been an honour and a privilege. Thank you. <laughs>